evidence for the historicity of the Gospels. Let me just explain what I mean by external and what I mean by historicity. For external evidence, I am looking at evidence from outside of the For external evidence, evidence, I am looking... Sorry. There we go. Shannon, Shannon. Is kind of trying to that. Looking for uh, material from outside of Scripture that dovetails in various ways, and we can talk about what those ways are, with the material that we find in the Gospels and the Book of Acts, the historical books, and as we've already seen, Acts is bound up very tightly with the Gospel of Luke. So there are two ways to go about this. You can look for confirmation of the big events from a Christian perspective, right? Jesus died. He was said to have appeared alive again. And that's interesting when you can get it. It's very dramatic. You cannot expect a non-Christian to say that Jesus rose from the dead for the simple reason that anybody who really believed that almost inevitably and immediately became a Christian. Uh, I remember there was some flap when uh, Pincus Lapide, a, a Jewish writer, said that he, he thought the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus was very good, but, but he was going to stay a Jew, even though he thought probably Jesus was raised from the dead, and one of his fellow rabbis snapped, if I thought Jesus had been raised from the dead, I'd be baptized tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Which might make sense to me. I, I see that, and I think that was probably the attitude of uh, early people who were aware of Christianity but didn't buy into it. So the thing that I wanted to look at here is non-Christian evidence for as much as we could expect a non-Christian to say. But that is rather limited because for a long time, really up until near to the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, with only isolated uh, instances of departure from this, Christianity was viewed as a branch of Judaism. From a Roman point of view, from the point of view of a Greek-speaking, philosophically inclined Roman, or a Roman magistrate, the Jews were crazy, and the Christians were so crazy that even the Jews thought these zealots were even crazier. And uh, so, unless when it was convenient, like in the case of uh, Nero's trying to pin the blame for the fire of Rome on the Christians, the Christians were just, as Renan puts it, they were lost on the dark background of Judaism. Nobody could be troubled to take that much interest in their crazy beliefs because they were just the craziest of the crazy Jews. And the Jews were pretty much despised and cordially returned the compliment. The Jews despised the Gentiles and had no dealings with some of them and, and limited their contact with them. They wouldn't intermarry. They didn't acknowledge their gods. So they were quite unpopular. So we can't expect a whole lot of references. And some of the sources that we've got, we shouldn't expect the references from. If I were to put bookends a foot apart here, I could enclose within that space all of the surviving writings from the Roman Empire from the middle decades of the first century when the Gospels were being written. And in most of those writings, you would expect to find no mention of Christianity. We have got a treatise on agriculture by Cagliamella. Lots of reason to expect information about planting trees, no particular reason to expect information about Jesus. You can find a satire written by a friend of Nero. There's no particular reason that the Christians should come up there. So if we look and see that we've got only a few references, a couple in Josephus, largely genuine, though in the one case probably interpolated by a Christian hand a bit, or a reference in Tacitus, or a reference in Pliny, those are probably as much as we have any right to expect that we would have. I'm going to assume, though, that you've heard about at least the big ones. You know about Tacitus in Annals 1544 and his description of the Great Fire of Rome. You've heard about Pliny saying that he tortured a couple of deaconesses to find out what the Christians believed, and it was just some kind of depraved superstition. And instead, I want to focus on the other kind of evidence, which is more interesting. It's the evidence that the writers of the Gospels, including Luke, who wrote Acts, are very much aware of details about the time and the historical setting 
of the events that they describe. So thoroughly aware that it is a really good case that they knew what they were talking about. And that, in turn, says things about the genre of the Gospels. It says these are historical in intent, written by people who are well informed. And that will dovetail with what we talked about in the first talk this morning about the authorship of the Gospels. So, to do this, let me uh, just give you a sketch of the history of Palestine between the years 6 BC and AD 44. So, we have a 50 year span of time. If we read the Jewish historian Josephus, we find that this was first a united kingdom under Herod the Great. After Herod's death, it's divided up into a bunch of tetrarchies and ethnarchies. Uh, Herod's heirs took different bits of the kingdom. Then Judea is reduced still further to the level of a Roman province when Archelaus is deposed for mismanagement, but the others retain their standing, so it didn't happen to the whole thing at once. Um, then it's reunited under a single native ruler, Herod Agrippa I. And finally, it's wholly reduced to the level of a Roman province, although there is still a certain amount of influence retained by Herod Agrippa II, who has certain sacerdotal powers, and when it's a religious matter, he's often deferred to. So we find all of that from Josephus. Well, how does it stand in the New Testament? United Kingdom under Herod the Great. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, right? Jesus is born in the reign of Herod the Great. Division into tetrarchies. We see an example of this in Matthew 2, 22. Herod is dead. Archelaus, his oldest son, has stepped into position of ruling in Judea. But we also discover that Herod Antipas, a younger son, is in charge up in Galilee. So this division among Herod's heirs is reflected in the text. Uh, Judea is being reduced to the level of a Roman province with a procurator in charge of it, somebody who answers to Caesar and collects money for Caesar. Will we find this with the rulership of different other areas still in the hands of native ethnarchs and tetrarchs in Luke chapter 3, verse 1? Do you remember how that works? It's a really important verse just for nailing down some of the historical timeline. So Luke says, Luke 3, 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene. See how that works? He's showing you a map of this, and that's all consonant with what we know from Josephus. Uh, it's reunited into a kingdom under a single native ruler, Herod Agrippa I. Well, Acts 12.1 shows us something that's happening at that time period. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Here's a curious fact. For <clears throat> decades prior to this, there had been no king with authority as a king in Judea where Jerusalem is. And after Herod Agrippa I's death, there was never again a king who had authority there. But during the last three years of his reign, he was invested with this, and we have coins to prove it, that say Agrippa Basileus, Agrippa the king. So we can prove this from other sources, we can show it from Josephus, but that fact, that detail, that Luke calls him Herod the king, nails this time period down very accurately. And then it's wholly reduced to the level of a Roman province. Well, we see that in Acts chapter 26, right? Paul's in prison, and who's in charge while Paul is in prison? It's Festus, or she is Festus, who's inherited that from Antonius Felix, both Romans, not a king. But along comes Agrippa II, son of Agrippa I, and Festus says, 
why don't you come and listen to this case? It's got it's some Jewish thing. You would know about that. And so he has Agrippa the second come and listen to the case with him in Acts chapter 26. So all of this, this minefield where things change so much, you cannot find a 50-year period in the history of England where there are so many changes and subtleties and portions are reduced and other portions are not. And yet through this incredibly complex period, the New Testament writers move sure-footedly. They never put a foot wrong. They nail it on every one of these. That's remarkable enough to make us say, how did they know that? And the answer cannot be, well, they looked it up on Wikipedia, right? <laughs> there is no Wikipedia. You can't do that. So the answer has to be that they've got sources of information or they are themselves people who live in that era. So either they knew people who had lived then or they were mm. people who had lived then. There's really, I think, no other good answer. And the evidence for this is redoubled by the fact that when you look at the history timeline and you go a little further on, there's this great gulf that opens up at the year 70. Because when Jerusalem is wiped out, all kinds of information is lost. And somebody who had not lived in Jerusalem after that time would find it very difficult to get reliable information about what had gone on there. I think that increases the credibility of saying that the gospel authors were authors who lived at this time. But that's just the beginning. This is just the broad sketches of the major things. Let's look at what we find as a result of the complexity of this history. Remember that because Palestine had passed under Roman control with the consent of a large proportion of the population, it was never conquered, properly speaking. And that meant that they were allowed a certain amount of autonomy through the period of Jesus' life. So this gives rise to a curious mixture of things. We have a double system of taxation. There's a Jewish taxation. Remember Matthew 17? Does your master, your rabbi, pay the didrachma, the temple tax? That's a religious tax collected by Jews, ostensibly for use on the temple itself, although sometimes the Romans would raid that money to do things like constructing an aqueduct, and the Jews would usually riot when they did. But there's also a Roman tax, right? So let, let's look at, uh, say, Mark 12 here. verses 13 and 14. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or not? Well, that's not the temple tax. That's not a Jewish tax. That's talking directly about paying taxes to Caesar. So we have a double system of taxation that's reflected in the New Testament. We have two different systems of marking the years. There's a Roman system, which we find in Luke 3, right? In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, the year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar can be calculated in two different ways. He was the only ruler from the year 14 AD onward. But two years earlier than that, in the year 12, he had assumed the co-regency with Augustus. That made the transition somewhat smoother. So we could calculate it from one or the other of those. I'll get to that in a little while. But the main thing that I want to point out is that People who are keeping track of these things from a Roman point of view will think of the years in terms of the years of the Caesars. But there's also a Jewish way of reckoning, and that's why the tenure of particular high priests. And so, looking at Luke 3, again, that wonderful verse 3.1, okay, uh, he's told us all of this stuff about the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and then he moves on. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, 
So there's a Jewish way of reckoning these things as well. If you don't care much about Rome, you certainly, if you're a Jew, care about who's the high priest. So we have two systems of marking the years. There's been a change in the way that watches are kept at night. This is one that you might not even think of, but if you read the Old Testament, read Lamentations 2.19 or Judges 7.19, what do you find there? They speak of a middle watch of the night. But a middle watch suggests that there are three watches, each one four hours long. Compare that with the Roman division of the night, and you'll find that the Romans divide it into four watches, and this is reflected in Matthew 14.25, Mark 13.35. So this is something that you would not expect them to have come up with if they were inventing it post hoc and looking at the Old Testament to get their information. But the system of sending out watches in the night has changed. The Romans do it in three-hour shifts. The Jews did it in four-hour shifts. There's a double military command. There's a Jewish command in uh, John 18.3, right? Who are these guys uh, who are hauling Jesus around? This is a group of the Levitical temple guard. They are not Roman soldiers. They're under the direct control of the rulers of the temple. But, of course, at the cross, Jesus is crucified by the order of Pilate. And there are four soldiers, a Roman quaternion, there at the cross, and they're dividing up Jesus' effects into four piles. There's a double administration of justice. There's a Jewish one, the trial of Jesus by night at Caiaphas' house. And what's the charge on which they convict, the, in their own minds, Jesus, right? What, what is the charge? Heresy. It's not just heresy, it's blasphemy. blasphemy. Right? What Roman cares about blasphemy? The Romans don't give any concern to blasphemy, right? They would say, as Gallio said when they rioted, Right? Well, this is some Jewish thing. Look after it yourselves. It's no concern to me. But when they come to Pilate, what do they say? What's the charge that they make there? This man makes himself to be a king. To be Christ, a king. Whoa. That's something quite different. That's a charge a Roman has to think about. I'll come back to that in a minute, moment, too. But we've got it. So, so far, a double system of taxation, two systems of marking the years, distinct systems of the night watches in that transition from the Old Testament to the New, a double military command, a double administration of justice. There are two modes of capital punishment, but one of them now can't be done without Roman permission. How did the Jews kill people? Stoning. How do the Romans kill people? They'll flog them and then crucify them, Right? But because the Romans are in military control, even though the Jews have a certain amount of freedom, they don't have the right to give capital punishment. They sometimes break that. Stoning of Stephen's an example of that. But strictly speaking, that's not something that's within their purview. And finally, we find that there are two principal languages being spoken. Among the Jews, Aramaic is the common language. But the Romans speak principally Greek. All of this is reflected in the New Testament. All of this is consonant with this complexity of the situation in Palestine. So we see that not only do they get the broad outline of who was in charge at which times right, they also get all of these little minute weird aspects of the situation right. But there's more. Let's look at some details of persons that are named in the New Testament, not just the fact that they're named and that we can say, yeah, they were there at that time, but more than that. Pilate is everywhere properly portrayed in the New Testament. He's given the same title that Tacitus gives to it. But there are details about the interactions he has with the Jews that ring true when we compare those with Josephus. Here are some examples. Um, Pilate insisted on bringing some Roman eagles into the city. The Jews thought this is a violation of the Second Commandment. No graven images in the likeness of anything. And they flipped out. He tried to brazen it out, but eventually he withdrew them. Then he had some votive shields brought in by night and just put on the wall in his personal quarters where nobody else had to see them. But word got out, and the Jews, thinking that perhaps there were some graven images on those shields, rioted. Pilate really tried to stick to his guns. The Jews wrote to Rome 
and appealed to Caesar. And he, Pilate actually got a note back from Tiberius Caesar saying, you take those blankety blank shields down and don't antagonize the natives. So he took them down. And now, think of how appropriate that charge is that they brought against Jesus, right? How well chosen their language is. If you let this man go, John says in John 18, 12, you are not Caesar's friend. They know exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's not just that Pilate's a governor and he's there. It's the specific nature of the charge that is so true to life at a detailed level. Or let's talk about Pilate's wife. Pilate's wife. So he was married. Is this supposed to be some kind of deep, apologetically interesting point? Actually, <laughs> kind of so, because you see, um, there was a long-standing rule in Rome that had been put in place by Caesar Augustus that when a governor was appointed to a province, his wife was not to go with him. Well, do we have a problem here? <clears throat> Looks like that Roman rule would have been violated. Maybe the authors of the New Testament made a mistake, do you think, in putting Pilate's wife there? But actually, Tacitus gives us a beautiful insight. He relates in Annals, book 3, chapters 33 and 34, that Severus Cacina in the Senate raised the question of women's presence in the provinces. And what he tried to do was to reinstate the enforcement of the rule against it because that rule had for so long been ignored. And when he put it to a vote, he got voted down. So here we find in passing in this kind of very oblique way that yes, there had been such a rule, but it was disregarded very widely at that time. You say, do we have any other evidence it was disregarded? Yes, we do. Seneca writes a letter to his mother from exile, and she's, uh, she's in some distress, and he tries to console her. He draws her attention to the behavior of her sister. Her sister was the wife of the governor of Egypt. And he talks all about how modest and how prudence she was while she was with her husband in Egypt. So all of this corresponds very closely to what we see in the New Testament, even in such a little thing as the fact that Pilate's wife is with him there. That's the ring of truth. Or let's look at Antonius Felix. He was the first of the Roman governors under whom Paul was imprisoned. Uh, what do we find in Acts 24, 26? What's Felix doing keeping Paul in prison? What's he hoping for? He's hoping for a bribe. Why would he hope for a bribe from Paul? What had Paul been doing? <laughs> Paul had been collecting money to bring for the relief of his people in Judea, right? Brought that to Jerusalem. Now, Felix, not at all uh, surprisingly, reasons that if he'd been the one collecting the money, he'd have taken it a little bit off the top and stashed it away somewhere. He figures Paul's got some cash sitting around. And maybe after half a year or a year in chains, Paul will decide that it's worth his while to pay the bribe and get out of jail. Paul, of course, hasn't done that. Paul didn't collect anything off the top of that. He just brought the money that had been collected. But Felix was not the most scrupulous of men. In fact, Felix was notoriously brutal and licentious. And uh, he was brutal in the way that he put down several rebellions. This is important because when we read in Acts 24 the story of Paul's accusation and defense before Felix, prior governor, before Festus. Um, what do the Jews do? They hire an orator. And Tertullus comes in, and we have just a sketch of what he must have said, but in that sketch, it's all very true to life. What does Tertullus thank Felix for doing? Oh, having put down various disorders and abuses. Notice he carefully leaves out of sight the fact 
that he did it with unnecessary severity. No, he just focuses on how you have put down disorders, and this man was causing riots. Do you see how the charge fits not just into what's convenient for the Jews, it fits into what they think is most likely to influence Felix himself. What does this guy like to do? Keep order. Well, we'll accuse Paul of having disrupted the order. Perfect. It all fits the details that we know of the character. Oh, while Paul is in prison, in Felix's custody, what does he speak to him about? Do you remember? He speaks to him, we're told in Acts 24-25, about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. So he's a preacher. He preaches about righteousness and self-control and judgment. Yeah, but those are actually especially well chosen for Felix. Uh, here's a description of Felix from Tacitus not a Christian writer at all, just a Roman historian. Claudius entrusted the province of Judea to the Roman knights or to his own freedmen, one of whom, Antonius Felix, indulging in every kind of barbarity and lust, exercised the power of a king in the spirit of a slave. Not a very flattering portrayal. <laughs> uh, so let's see what Tacitus says in Annals Book 12. Chapter 54. Speaking of Pallas, first a freedman, and then he has some good things to say about him. Not equally moderate was his brother, surnamed Felix, who had for some time been governor of Judea and thought he could do any evil act with impunity, backed up as he was by such power. It is true that the Jews had shown symptoms of commotion in a seditious outbreak, and when they heard of the assassination of Caius, there was no hearty submission, as fear still lingered that any of the emperors might impose the same orders. This is Caius Caligula, who had threatened to erect a golden statue of himself in the temple in Jerusalem, causing no end of commotion among the Jews. Felix, meanwhile, by ill-timed remedies, stimulated disloyal acts. While he had his arrival in the worst wickedness, Ventidius Cumanus, who held a part of the province, which was so divided that Galilee was governed by Cumanus, Samaria by Felix. The two peoples had long been at feud, and now less than ever restrain their enmity, and so it talks about how they start wars with one another, and that threatened to expand. Uh, but Felix managed, there was some arbitration set in, and Felix managed to get installed as one of the people to settle the whole matter between these two groups, and so decision was made against Cumanus, but he was not a nice guy. Um, but what, what's this about barbarity and lust? Well, let's go to Josephus in the Antiquities, book 20, chapter 7, section 2. While Felix was procurator of Judea, he saw Drusilla and fell in love with her, for she did indeed exceed all other women in beauty, and he sent to her a person whose name was Simon, a Jewish friend of his, by birth is Cypriot, who pretended to be a magician. Simon endeavored to persuade her to forsake her present husband and marry Felix. And promised that if she would not refuse Felix, he would make her a happy woman. Accordingly, she acted unwisely, and because she longed to avoid her sister Bernice's envy, for Drusilla was very ill-treated by Bernice because of Drusilla's beauty, was prevailed upon to transgress the laws of her forefathers and marry Felix. So she divorced her husband, which there's no provision for in Jewish law. Now, go back to what Paul was preaching about, right? What is Paul preaching about to him? Righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. It's beginning to sound like a very appropriate choice of topics. One more little detail about Felix, uh, and this from a correspondence between something we see about Felix and a subsequent governor. Why does Felix leave Paul in prison when Festus takes over. Do you remember what he says? In Acts. It says he is willing to do the Jews a favor. So he left Paul in prison when Festus came in to take over. That's why Festus finds him and he says, uh, okay, we should do something about this. Well, 
that willingness to do the Jews a favor upon the occasion of your exiting the position is interestingly mirrored by something that we read not about Festus, but about his successor, Albinus. When Albinus heard that Gassius Florus, the next procurator, was coming to succeed him, he was desirous, says Josephus, to appear to do something that might be grateful to the people of Jerusalem. So he takes all the people who are in prison, the people who clearly need to be killed, he just has executed. And all the rest of them, he sets free. It's a bad move. The result is that a lot of these people, who were really not great guys, even if they weren't worthy of capital punishment, end up becoming robbers, and so the hills are infested with robbers. But do you see the similarity in that desire to do a favor to the Jews as one of your last acts as you're leaving? Just another curious point of congruence there. These are a few illustrations out of many, many more that could be given. Uh, and I've chosen these particularly because I haven't talked about these in some previous talks, but I can give you a few more. Take Matthew verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 22. Herod the Great is dead. Joseph, Mary, and the infant Jesus are on the road coming back from Egypt, back up into Judea. They're headed back to Bethlehem, the place they left from. That makes sense. And what do we find in Matthew 2.22? Speaking of Joseph here. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being more than a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Now I want you to notice three things here. First, let's take the last clause. He goes to the district of Galilee. <clears throat> Herod the Great's dominions extended into Galilee. Why is that safe? Ah, but remember that Herod the Great's domains have been broken up into numerous little tetrarchies. Galilee is under the control of his younger son. So Galilee is not Archelaus territory. That's nice. Let's look at the word reigning as a king. This is interesting. Notice what it does not say. It doesn't say that Archelaus was king. It says he was reigning as one. Well. It's a small point, right? Participle instead of a noun. So what, you say? But it matters, and here's why. Archelaus was never king in Judea. But one of the charges that the Jews made about him when he began to cause trouble was that he had usurped the position of his father without actually being approved by Caesar. Here's how it would usually go. A client king of the Romans, somebody who was Rex Amicus or Rex Socius, uh, would keep order and collect the taxes, send Caesar his money. If things were going pretty smoothly, there was no need to rock the boat. So when that client king died, he would leave a will, and except in unusual circumstances, that will would be honored, and the people would be installed in the various places that he had asked them to be installed. So you could have expected the Romans eventually to do that, but when Herod died, there was no time to send an email note to Rome and say, hey, what do you want us to do? We've got to settle this tonight. The mails were pretty quick in the Roman Empire, but they weren't that fast, and so he stepped right into the situation and said, I'm in charge here. My father's will says so but he wasn't officially recognized as a king. Later, when he tried to get that recognition, Rome did a kind of split the difference maneuver. They said, well, you can stay in charge there. But they never conferred the title of king upon him. So he is kinging in the Greek. He's reigning as a king, but he isn't a king. That little detail, it's right. But there's a bigger question here. We've already seen that if Archelaus was the eldest son, then we might have expected that he would step into place as ruler of at least part of his father's dominion. That makes sense. That was in accordance with custom. And Matthew knows that Herod the Great is dead. That's why Matthew's coming back, right? He's not going to come back if the one who's seeking the child's life isn't dead. So here it comes. And he hears that Archelaus is reigning, but he could have predicted that more or less already, knowing that Herod the Great was dead. 
So why does learning something he should have known already cause him to change his plans and go somewhere totally different? You will not find any further information about this in the New Testament. This is the only time that Archelaus is ever mentioned. But there is a backstory in Book 17 of Josephus Antiquities. Here's the backstory. One of the last things Herod the Great did before he died was to have some Jews executed for sedition. Sedition would be a serious thing if they had been saying, let's rise up and revolt against Rome. But in fact, what they had done was something much more ambiguous. Some Romans, with Herod's approval, had placed some Roman shields with Roman eagles up on the wall in front of the temple. The Jews went ballistic. This is a violation of the Second Commandment. And so they got two young men to climb up and cut down the shields. They cut the ropes and let the shields drop. Not going to stand for that. Herod found out who had done it, and he had the perpetrators, uh, or actually instigators, executed brutally. And since the Jews viewed this as a matter of their religion and their defense of the purity of their religion, this did not go over well at all. And then Herod the Great died. His dying, though, does not bring the executed Jews back to life, obviously. And it's just before Passover when hundreds of thousands of Jews are converging on Jerusalem for a seven-day festival, right? Actually, eight-day. Well, that news spread like wildfire while all these Jews were coming in, and they didn't like it any more than the people who lived in Jerusalem liked it. Sorry. So, a large mob of Jews got into an argument with a smaller group of Roman soldiers. Things got out of hand. The Jews stoned the soldiers. Some of them died. The people in the mob ran into the temple. I'm on base. You can't touch me. And here's Archelaus. He's said, I'm in charge. He doesn't actually have a mandate from Rome, and he's never going to get that mandate if Jerusalem blows up. And Roman soldiers are killed with nobody called to account for it. So he panics. He sends a troop of horsemen out. He says, surround the temple. Don't let anybody inside get out. Don't let anybody outside come in. And then he sends troops directly into the temple and slaughters 3,000 Jews in the temple. Passover is canceled. He tells all of the assembled people, go. Now let's go back on the road from Alexandria back up towards Judea. And here's Joseph. And he hears that Archelaus is reigning in his father's stead in Judea. It's not just that he hears that he's reigning in his father's stead. Pilgrims fleeing from Judea are going out on all the roads away, including roads coming down into Egypt. And he finds out it is almost inevitable what Archelaus has done. And he thinks to himself, now, why did I leave Judea? Ah, yes, there was a homicidal maniac on the throne. Where am I headed? Back to Judea, and there's a brand new homicidal maniac on the... I think we'll go somewhere else. But those very pilgrims who are bringing him word probably confirm for him that Galilee, where we know he has property, is under the control of someone else. So to Galilee they go. Do you see the multiple touches of realism, the ring of truth, even in such a small reference as that? Archelaus is mentioned one time, but at three specific points in that one verse, the fact that he was not actually appointed king, but was ruling as one, the fact that he did not have jurisdiction over Galilee, and the fact that there was a lot of reason for a Jew who was skittish about Jew-killing kings to avoid him, all come together. Throughout the historical books of the New Testament, the Gospels and Acts, personages are named with this kind of meticulous attention to detail. And yet it's not a historical study of Palestine. Josephus gives us that. These guys are mentioning these characters and nailing these little details about them, even though they're incidental. The fact that Pilate's wife was with him was not the objective of the gospel writers to convey to us. They just wanted to convey 
Oh, and she sent him a message and said, don't have anything to do with Jesus. Don't get your hands dirty here. It's important that we not do this. And yet, they get right the fact that governors often had their wives with them, despite the fact that Augustus had outlawed it. Over and over and over, these little details fit together. This is the ring of truth. When you put that on top of the substantial case that we can give for the traditional authorship of the Gospels, it shows that not only is there good reason to think that these were guys who were up close to the facts, they internally give every evidence of having exactly that kind of contact with the facts. That's the kind of evidence that should make a historian or someone historically minded look at these documents and say, these are historical records that have a great deal of value. And in fact, Roman historians and classicists have long been puzzled by New Testament scholarship. You start with all this promising material. Why do you come to such skeptical conclusions? We don't get it. Even those who have no interest in the supernatural say, well, but this is surely an authentic record of life in the first century, if nothing else. Can't you see this from all of these points of detail? And they could if they weren't in the grip of an overriding ideology. I'll stop there for now. I've got more that I could say in this line, but some of you may have questions that you want to raise, and so I don't want to get ahead of you on that front. So let's just take some time for questions. Have you ever considered writing a commentary on the New <laughs> Testament? I have thought about it, but I am daunted because I know Craig Keener. <laughs> and Craig is uh, so far my master in this. Uh, has, have have y'all ever heard the story about Craig's commentary on the book of Acts? He had a contract with a publisher to write a, a commentary on Acts. Well, you know, commentaries on Acts, you, they can go from the 300 to the 700, the 800, the 900 page. You know, the, uh, but he got a contract. He spent 10 years reading through most of the Loeb Classical Library, generating his own references, which he wrote down on three by five cards <laughs> and kept in his living room. Wow. <laughs> and in the fullness of time, he sent them electronically the text for the commentary. And this publisher, somebody at the publishing house, called him up about it and started screaming at him over the phone. Because if they published what he sent them in their standard commentary series, in that format, his commentary on one book, the book of Acts, would be 7,000 pages long. I'm not that good. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love this stuff, and I try to do this stuff, but I'm not that good. And so if I ever wrote something, it would be um, a pale reflection of what Craig can bring to bear on this. He's got a different publisher now who has agreed to put the whole thing out, I think they're going to shrink the font way down and bring it out in just four volumes. <laughs> Patrick? Oh, that one I thought, I was just thinking, there could be something said for brevity. <laughs> <laughs> something to be said for brevity. Well, perhaps. Um, what I would like to do, I think, is to write something at some point that would just draw attention to some of the kinds of things I've been sharing with you. There are a lot of these details that we miss. You know, we've got homiletical commentaries. We want to get the spiritual message. That's all very important. And I, I will say nothing against well-written commentaries of that kind. But sometimes it's important just to have one place to go and say, there's history here. But again, I'm daunted because there was a Craig Keener back in the 18th century whose name was Nathaniel Lardner. And he... Uh, he studied for the ministry, had a fabulous education, and went stone deaf. It affected his elocution. He couldn't preach. And so in silence, he turned the rest of a very long life to scholarship. He produced many works. One of them is called Credibility of the Gospel History. And in it, he takes every significant person, place, or event mentioned in the Gospels and Acts, and then combs through the literature of the first five centuries for any reference to it, lays everything out side by side, translates it for you. Oh, was it in Latin? That's okay. He translates it, and then he gives you the Latin at the bottom of the page in case you want to check his translation. In Greek, there's the Greek at the bottom of the page. Whatever the language is, he knows it, he does it, and he gives you then a connected survey 
of all that has been said on this issue all the way up to his own time. If you want to know, what did the church fathers say about this? What did Calvin say? Luther, Origen, Beza, Dr. Prideaux. It's all there in Lardner. And he published this in 17 volumes. <laughs> I have it. I have the whole thing. Uh, there's places where our understanding of the history has advanced since his time. But you have to just stand in awe of someone who will put in a good chunk of his lifetime pulling together all of that material. One thing it will do for you, though, if you ever get a hold of a copy of that, and I'll send it to you for free if you want to, just, just tell me. Um, people who say Jesus never existed, when you encounter them, you will suffer agonies trying not to burst out laughing. It's just, <laughs> it's, and so, uh, please, come on. Is that really your position? Are you really going to say that? Because there's so much. It's just an overwhelming amount of evidence. But I, I understand what you're saying, Patrick and, and Ken. That there is something to be said for presenting some of it in a briefer, more digestible form. But somebody's done that, too. William <laughs> Haley, in his view of the evidence of Christianity in Part 2, takes about 40 specific details out of Lardner and just condenses it all into one chapter. Like, this is... This is the best of the best sampler from Lardner, condensed. So there's a one chapter version of that. I'll give you that too. Tell me what you want. I'll provide it. We'll, we'll, we can put it up online. I'm sure Matt will provide a place for us to put all this stuff up online. So yeah, there's wonderful material. The little booklet that I've given you, the historical illustrations of the New Testament scriptures, MacLear has gone through Lardner and pulled out a bunch of information there, there is uh, a slip or two on pages 15 and 17, I think. There's a, yeah, he says Tacitus, one place where he means Josephus, and he makes one slip attributing something to Archelaus, to Pilate that was done by Archelaus. Everything else, though, no problems. Uh, but there's just a huge amount of information here. So there's information out there. I say, let's read the old stuff. And that's why I've tried to put these resources into your hands so that you'll have a place to go and you'll be able to incorporate this, I hope, in some of your own teaching, your writing, your interactions with other people. This is the reason that I've tried to put this evidence out for you. But I cannot claim originality in pulling together any of it. It's all been done before. Other questions? Or do you just want more? <laughs> Do you want more? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. All right. So let's talk about that passage where they send some people to Jesus, butter him up a little bit, and say, should we really be paying taxes to Caesar? What does Jesus say? Notice, and, and Jesus is just brilliant at this. I tell sometimes my undergraduates, whatever you think of Jesus, whatever your opinion about his religious standing, you have to understand that he was a genius. <laughs> he says, bring me a, a, not just a coin, but specifically a denarius. Bring me a denarius. Whose image and superscription does it bear? So they bring him a coin. And uh, but he holds it out and says, whose image and superscription are that? You can tell. Something's gone wrong with their track because they're looking at their sandal straps and saying, Caesar's. Okay, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the thing and to God the things that are God's. I always thought that was a great story. But then I looked up a picture of a denarius minted under Tiberius Caesar, and it gets better. First thing, of course, is that it bears Tiberius' face. Now, in Sephoris in Galilee, when they minted coins, out of deference to the Jews, they did not put anyone's face on the coins in order not to rile up the Jews. But there it is. Bold relief. It's Whose image is it? It's the image of Caesar. Now, the word rendered image there is the same word that the Jews used when they translated the Old Testament into Greek. 
the Septuagint. And it's the word that's used in Genesis for man's being made in the image of God. Do you see, then, the point of what Jesus says? Whose image does this have? Oh, Caesar's? Give it to Caesar. Whose image do you have? God's image. Give that to God. God can't cash out of state checks in heaven. He wants you. But it's better than that. Because if you read the superscription around it, it's in Latin with abbreviations. But if you unpack that abbreviation and spell it out, here's what it says. Tiberius Augustus Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. The divine Augustus? Yeah. In the superscription written around the edge of this coin, the Romans are promoting the worship of the previous Roman emperor as a god. So what is Jesus saying, not only about the image, but about the superscription? This image, by the standards you yourselves are enforcing these days, should be a violation of the second commandment. The superscription is a violation of the first. You shall have no other gods. What are you doing coveting this, trying to come up with an excuse to keep this? Your own standards condemn you. Your own law condemns you. That is so wretched on their part. And Jesus brilliantly, all he does is to ask for a denarius and show them what it says. You know, after I think one more try, it says, and after that time, nobody dared to ask me any more <laughs> questions. And you can see why. <laughs> but do you see why I'm bringing this up? Details, little details that you might just blow right past, right? Oh, there was something about Jesus and a coin and taxes, and Jesus said, yeah, pay your taxes. No, it's more than that. It's better than that. It's richer than that. And when you pay attention to the details, you see how that comes out. You know, one detail gotten right could just be a lucky stab. Two could be chance, though two or three, it's beginning to look like that's not the way to bet. But when you've got this welter of details over and over and over, I don't know what reaction you have to it, but as I've studied this stuff, I, I just feel like I'm standing at the bottom of a mountain watching an avalanche come down. Okay, I admit, it's history. I give up. Don't bury me. And one of the things that's hard, of course, is that if you love this kind of material, then when you get in conversations, you're tempted to just dump the truck like, all right. We're going to go for three hours, and I'm just going to give it all to you. And that's probably not the best interpersonal tactic either. But what I do want to do is to persuade you, those of you who are here, anybody who's watching online, that there is an enormous body of historical evidence. And even if you only master two or three pieces, you're in the conversation. Learn a little bit and know where to go for more. That's all I ask. You don't have to have 50 things ready to go. You can have three. That'll do it. You're in the conversation at that point. You're presenting reasons and evidence. And if they want more, y'all know where to reach me. More questions? Or do you just want me to go on and do another one? Yeah. Uh, do you read any of uh, Bart Ehrman, uh, any, of his, uh, any of his stuff? I believe I have read every book that he has published. Uh, including uh, Did Jesus Exist, his newest one? Ah, I'm sorry, I forgot that one has come out. Actually, I have seen a lot of discussion of that. I have not read that, but my understanding is that the parts where he says, no, 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 don't take me to be any evangelical or anything, yeah. are recyclings of stuff that he wrote in misquoting Jesus okay. and Jesus Interrupted and things like that. And I am distinctly unimpressed with his lines of argument there, and I've addressed those in some other uh, cases. I, I, you know, the bit about hand washing, for example. Well, you know, Mark 7 says this thing about the Jews don't eat unless they wash their hands. Wow, that's just not true. No footnotes, no citation. Well, why would you think it's not true? Because Jewish law doesn't force non 
priests to wash that frequently. And so Herman appears to be, assuming he leaves us to try to figure out what his reason is, as the best I can come up with, that if they weren't forced to do it, they wouldn't do it. But in fact, this was the Puritan era in Judaism, and they believed in something that might correspond approximately to the priesthood of all believers. And a lot of them did this. And so there's just a welter of archaeological evidence and textual evidence showing that, yes, even the people who were not priests would engage in this. We found these mikvah, these, these ritual washing pools, all over from the first century, even at Masada, right, where the Jews hold up after the destruction of Jerusalem. It took the Romans three more years to come and conquer them on the mountaintop, and then almost all of them committed suicide before the Romans could get there. Even there, they've got one of these ritual purification pools so that you can wash and obey the law as they see it handed down in the traditions of their fathers. It's not written in Torah that you have to do that. But remember the enormous appeal that the Pharisees had. The Pharisees had the people enthralled these are the really holy guys. And they, whom Jesus excoriated as laying extra burdens on men's backs and then finding ways to evade them themselves, these guys pushed the ritual purification, the washing. That was huge with them. So, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've read Bart's stuff, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm just not very impressed with it. Uh, there is a certain art to... Um, elevating molehills into mountains and I think that he's very good at that and making and, and there's also of course um, the, the beautiful truth that we read in Proverbs that everyone's case seems good until his adversary comes and cross examines him mm -hmm. and Bart is really really good at giving you just one side of every argument and then you, you're just left to your own devices to go find out where he's left out the things mm -hmm that would tell against him. Take the case of Matthew 9, 9, and the calling of Matthew being a reference to Matthew in the third person. He doesn't even engage with the evidence against that. He, there's not a scrap of information about that. If you're reading his footnotes, you will not find any leads that might take you to any document where you might discover that this was a common practice. Now, Bart is a bright guy. I admire his learning. Not so much his judgment, but he's got to know this. If you can find an explanation for his putting forward that argument that does not impugn his honesty, please tell me, because I can't find it. Mm -hmm. Patrick? Uh, just a curiosity question. Uh, in Matthew 12, it's the reference where Jesus said, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the hearts of the earth. Right. Um, so how do you coordinate that with the account that we've got? Yeah. Right. I think the phrase three days and three nights, right, uh, it is just a colloquial expression for three Jewish days as they counted the days. I don't think they meant it any more specifically and literally than I mean it when I tell you just a second. When I'm not going to be there in literally one second, right? It's an expression that's come to have a fixed meaning. It's an idiom at that point. And so I don't think he's saying three nights. And in fact, if you look at the end of Matthew, right, why do they set a watch at the tomb? What do they say? You're reading Matthew 27. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, day of preparation is Friday, so the next day is Saturday, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that the imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Wait, after three days until the third day? But for them, these expressions mean the same thing. You see what I'm saying? In their idiom, it's not that they're saying, he said he would rise after three days, so could you go secure the tomb for the three-day period and then leave so that on the very day that matters most, we won't have anybody there? 
That's not what they're saying. The Jews always counted any fragment of a day as a day, any fragment of a year as a year. And the expression three days and three nights does not really mean three night times. It's just an expression that means three days, like just a minute or hang on a second means for us. It's not got that sort of technical incorporation of the nights. Does that help? It does. And the reason I ask that is I know there are several idioms in the New Testament, like sure. um, the law, uh, abolish the law, that kind of thing. Right. Is there any good reference uh, that you can, you can handily just know that these are idioms in Jewish culture at the time? I recommend Craig Keener's Bible Background Commentary. It's put out by InterVarsity. And uh, it's one of his shorter books. I think it's only eight or 900 pages. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, but in that, what he has done is he's gone through the whole New Testament and tried to put in the information most important to know from the standpoint of Jewish background, cultural setting. And so he's incorporated a lot of this. And the whole thing's just organized, you know, front to back, Matthew through Revelation. So you can find it by passage and look it up. I really recommend that work. I have found it a useful thing to refer to, and I think you would, it, I don't know if it would answer every question you've got. I think it would answer a lot. I've heard the 12 used in that same context as to when Jesus appeared to the 12, when Judas was dead. Right. It's like, you know, appearing before the Senate when some right. people are missing. Luke says to the 11. Right, Luke wanted to get it just right. Okay, right. Judas, Judas is gone here, so Jesus is appearing to the eleven. But the title of the Dodeca had become synonymous with the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. And so the twelve is there. It's just a group name. And, and at that point, I think anybody who tries to say, there's a contradiction. Luke says it was eleven, and the other people say it was twelve. Oh, come on. Is that really your argument? You know, no. That's, that's not a serious argument. Uh, Criticism. So, yeah, it's just a name for the inner circle. There's the 70, there's the 12. Whether two of the 70 are, you know, off fishing and one of the 12 has gone to hang himself, that's a separate <laughs> issue. Other questions? On the, uh, the three days and three nights, um, the way I've always seen it, and I'd just like to see what you, you think of it. Um, even now with the uh, Jews, when they have time off for the Sabbath from their work, so they're, they're not required to work um, because of the, the religious discrimination laws, they, get, they start their Sabbath at 6 o'clock the Friday evening, and it goes until 6 o'clock Saturday evening because they do the evening first and the morning. And so you can get three days and three nights if you take the, the day of the preparation into Friday and you assume that started Friday evening, which for them would be our Thursday evening. And then you have Friday evening, Friday morning, Saturday evening, Saturday morning, Sunday evening, and then Sunday morning, which gives you three. Right. Months. The difficulty is Jesus was crucified on the on the Friday afternoon, and so between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning, you've got two nights. Right? You've got Friday night. You've got Saturday night. Okay. Yeah, I haven't looked into it in too much detail myself, but. Um, when you talk about Friday afternoon, could it be possible that that is a reference to the Friday evening, which came before the Friday day? No, I, I, I don't think. Uh, okay, so let me see if I can get what you're saying. And, and maybe, maybe this is just a different way of parsing out the idiom. You're saying there's a fragment of Friday in there if you're counting it by the Jewish reckoning. There's definitely all of Saturday in there by the Jewish reckoning. And then there's a fragment of what would be called Sunday. Is that what you're saying? And I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, I, I still have to study a little more myself, but I, I'm just wondering if maybe the crucifixion took place where he actually he actually died Friday evening, but that's a reference to our Thursday. I don't think so. There have been some attempts to say that John is incompatible with the synoptics on this point that they say Jesus died on the day of. Passover, and uh, John says he died on the day of preparation for Passover. This is one of our Ermans arguments. He says, well, don't, you know, take my word for it. Go read John 19 and mark for yourself and find out. But actually, if you go back and you read John 19, he doesn't say that Jesus died on the day of preparation for the Passover. He says he died on the day of preparation of 
Passover, you say, wow, that's like a nitpicky distinction. Who cares? Day of, day four. But actually, Mark uses the same word, preparation, par and paraskue, and he tells us what it means. It means, that is, the day before Sabbath. Preparation means preparation for Sabbath. And in John, you also read that Sabbath was a high day. That is, a Sabbath in Passover week, kind of like Easter Sunday, is a special Sunday for us. It's not just any Sunday. This is Easter Sunday, right? So actually, John and the synoptics are telling the same story. They're giving the same account. If you read in, uh, in John the 18, when they bring Jesus to Pilate, it says some of the Jewish leaders uh, didn't want to enter Pilate's dwelling because they wanted to eat the, the Pascha. Well, does that mean the Passover meal hadn't been eaten yet? No, John told us about that in John 13. What is it that they're afraid of? Well, it can't be an evening meal. It can't be the Passover Seder. Because by Jewish law, if you were ritually unclean, you had to wait until the sun went down, wash your hands, and you were clean. So if it was the Passover Seder they were worried about, the evening meal that occurs after sundown, all they had to do was wait and wash, and they were good to go. It must have been something else then. Well, what else could it be? Passover's a whole week full of meals. And there's a Hagiga, which is celebrated in the middle of the day, the day after the evening when you have the Passover Seder. Since it's in the middle of the day, the sun's not down yet. Since the sun's not down yet, there is no get out of jail free clause with washing your hands, and they would not have been able to eat the midday festival meal. And so I think when you look at this and you put all this stuff together, the case is overwhelming that John and the Synoptic Gospels are saying the same thing. They're saying that Jesus died on what we would call a Friday afternoon. It was a Friday afternoon after the beginning of what the Jews would count as Friday, we would call it Thursday night, when they ate this Passover Seder. And there are also interconnections between John's discussion of the meal in John 13 and the description of the Last Supper that we get in the Synoptic Gospels. I'll save that, though, and maybe talk about that a little bit in another talk that we'll do here in a few minutes. Is that, that fair? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. This may be too off topic. Uh, Deal it later. Okay. Moving on. Just got back from Cyprus on a mission mm. trip, dealt with a lot of refugees from Syria, so a big group of Muslims. Sure. Um, made a lot of headway. I've got tons of email conversations. Wonderful. Uh, the crucifixion, of course, which the Quran denies, happened. Right. Or, well, somebody got crucified, it just wasn't Jesus. There's like a body switch, right? right? Yeah. It made Jesus look like Jesus. Yeah. So. I didn't have a lot of problem with the deity of Christ, Son of God thing. Once you take the sex out of it, there. Okay, well, I can at least entertain the idea. Okay. But this idea of the crucifixion was, the, which of course is necess necessary for the resurrection. Right. The big stumbling block, and I sure. acknowledge that to them, and they, you know, they, they weren't up in arms about it. But I need to make headway in these conversations that are still ongoing. You know, you just say, I mean, you can't just, you can, but you say, well, the Quran's wrong. Uh, right, so there, there's a difficulty then in talking with Muslims about the crucifixion. How is it that we can help them to overcome the scandal of the cross, yeah. which for them is the scandal of God's actually dying? How can we overcome that? What can we say to them to help them to see that? I'm actually going to talk about that some in my next talk today. Okay. So how about if we, we pull this one to a close here, and I will bring that information up when we get back together. Matt, how long do you want us to take a break for here? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. For those of you who are watching by Internet, we'll be back in 15 minutes. There you go.